Good morning. Welcome. Morning. Let's all stand once again, and we're going to read our opening text, Psalm 23, this morning. Happy Lord's Day. Good to see each one here. Good to see those that are back from the uh, COVID trip, illness. Glad that you're with us. Be in prayer for those that still aren't with us. Psalm 32 this morning, title of the message is The Necessity of a prayer of forgiveness. Kind of a part two for last week. I'll explain that in a moment. Psalm 32, verse 1 says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture was turned into drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee at a time that when they may be found. Surely the floods of great waters, they shall come nigh unto him. And let's stop there and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before your throne this morning, first of all, with thankful hearts for all that you do for us, for your many blessings, for your watchful care. Lord, we ask that you be with us in the reading of this word, that it would touch our hearts, draw us close to you. Especially, Father, I pray that you would cause your word to convict us, help us to understand the error of our ways, that we might confess our sins before you. Father, I pray that you would be with those that are listening, that you would somehow convict hearts, especially the need of salvation. I pray, Father, your spirit would move and convict that such a need might be met even this day. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I guess um, maybe a little bit of explanation why, because we were going to get into a different aspect of the, the seven necessary disciplines of the Christian life, for mainly for church members. And last week we talked about the need for what I call aggressive prayer or um, fervent prayer is the term the Bible uses, mainly with regards to uh, prayer on behalf of others, intercessory prayer. And after I concluded that, I felt fine, but then the next day as I kind of was going over things in my head and kind of thinking towards this coming week, uh, something just didn't seem right, like something was missing from the necessity of prayer. And then it occurred to me that forgiveness of sins um, wasn't part of what Timothy, uh, the four points of prayer that Paul mentions in 1 Timothy chapter 2, but it's certainly a big part. So I wanted to address that this week, the necessity of the prayer of forgiveness. And there's a lot of angles to this. There's a lot to it. It's not going to be an exhaustive sermon. I want to highlight a few things that hopefully cause us to really think about how important this is. I'm sure we have a foundational understanding of how important forgiveness is. Everybody who has a testimony of salvation knows um, how important that initial act of forgiveness is when God washes our sins and makes us whole. We certainly understand that. And then I don't think this is a big shocker to anybody, but everybody who is saved also knows that we sin on a daily basis, you know, either in thought or in deed or in some other way. And there is a need for a a forgiveness of sins even after we're saved. And I'm going to touch on that in a moment, but I want to make a few points before we actually get into that part of the message. A couple of things I want to say with regards to forgiveness, and I don't even know if these really need to be said, but I thought that they were um, important enough to say, at least in this regards. And I'll explain this first point. It seems like, okay, no-brainer, like a duh. But two truths about forgiveness. Number one is that God never needs our forgiveness. God never needs to apologize for us for anything. Anything that happens in our lives, God does not need to apologize for a particular event happening, whether it be bad or well, certainly not good. Um, but God doesn't need to apologize and he certainly doesn't need our forgiveness. Why, why is that even a thought? I think sometimes people's lives, you might look at Job. I don't think Job, he, had, he never blamed God for the things that happened. His wife, however, told him to curse God and die. 
Um, so that's going a little bit overboard, I think. That's going to be emotional, reactionary type of a reaction. That was redundant. <laughs> but it was emotional. <laughs> she wasn't thinking things through. The fact is, bad things happen. Terrible things happen. I feel blessed, fortunate, that the bad things that I've experienced have never been on the level of horrendous. And some of you may have experienced things on the level of horrendous. My mind goes to, especially to children, who are so innocent, even at birth. I think the worst case, I can't imagine anything worse than this, perhaps. But you're, you're familiar with Helen Keller, right? Everybody's familiar with her, I think. Most people are. She was born deaf, blind, and dumb. Dumb meaning she couldn't speak. I can't even imagine um, growing up that way. She knew nothing different. That, that was her existence. That's all she knew. Um, so I don't think that as she became later in life, as she got older, that she blamed God for being that way. I don't even know if she has a testimony of salvation. I don't know that. But I just think as far as being born in a circumstance where it can't get much worse than that. Certainly kids are born with, um, you know, one of the things parents do is always count their fingers. And, you know, 10 fingers, 10 toes, that sort of thing. They're all there. And we're thankful for that. But there's physically things that are, happen. And it's not God's fault. None of that is God's fault. God doesn't even need to apologize for that happening in a person's life. And certainly we're thankful when things go our way. Uh, but I also think about children who are born in abusive homes where their parents are just terrible to them in so many ways. And the life that they grew up, they can become bitter and just angry at life, angry at the world, angry at their parents, and even ultimately angry at God. Why would God allow them to be born into this situation? So there's all kinds of tragedies, and the fact is it's all a result of sin. Not a particular sin that anybody has done, but it's just that sin is in the world and sin does damaging things. And sin, in its nature, can be random. It doesn't pick and choose who sin doesn't choose who it's going to affect on what level. It just affects us, and we're, it's sort of a random thing. However, God does allow these things to happen. I think one thing a person can be um, mindful of that is in a situation like that is God doesn't allow people to go through things that he will not help them through. He always helps people through these things. So point of that is that God does not need our forgiveness. Second one is this. Satan cannot be forgiven. We might want, we might want to blame a lot of things on him, but he's not going to apologize for anything that he does on a completely end of the, opposite end of the spectrum is God. Now, he may intentionally try to do things to ruin our lives. I think I mentioned last week where Jesus told Peter that Satan has asked for you, Peter, <laughs> that he may sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. And so Satan is going to go after anybody he can. Like a, a lion, as uh, I believe it's James says, uh, walking this earth, seeking who may be devour. He, he is relentless, and he is not apologetic. He has no sour feelings, sorry feelings, anything at all on what the damage that he may do. And the fact is, not only can he not be forgiven, but we cannot blame him for the things that happen. We cannot blame Satan for the things that we do. Um, I might be the only one here in this room old enough to remember this. I think I might have mentioned it before. But um, there was a... An actor back in the 70s who had a famous catchphrase, the devil made me do it, as he played a particular character, character named Geraldine, I think. Flip Wilson was his name. Um, but the devil made me do it kind of became his catchphrase. And, the, you know, there's slogans, the devil made me do it. No, the devil doesn't make us do anything. He can't make us do anything. Therefore, we can't blame him for anything. So he does not stand in a position of being forgiven. He is, there is no opportunity for repentance or having a relationship with God that will never happen again, whereas at one time he had that relationship with God. I kind of put this as a side note in parentheses. My notes here, I have number three in these two points of truth. There's a third 
in parentheses, but just an interesting thought. Animals and angels cannot be forgiven and they cannot be blamed for anything. You can't blame animals for a horrific action. I know that there are times if an animal gets aggressive and harms people, um, they will take that animal's life. But the animals, it's not evil. An animal doesn't need to apologize to a human being for destroying its life, being mauled uh, by a bear, for example. You can't blame that bear. What do they say? Don't poke a bear or something like that? <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a, I might have mentioned this before too. I, like I said, I need more stories. But this, this came to my mind, but um, years ago, long, long time ago, I can't even say her name, Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> but she had a, she used to have a television show and she was, um, it was advertised for I think several weeks ahead of time that she was going to have on her show a woman who literally had her face ripped off by a bear. Um, no, a monkey. It was a monkey. Oh. A pet monkey oh, I heard this. that she had. And it turned on her and literally ripped her face off. And she had to be reconstructed. And I forget what the whole thing was about, but I... I usually got home later than um, the sh her TV show was on. I think it was on like 3 o'clock. But I had a route sales job, and I can kind of work things out. So I, I had to be there to see that. <laughs> kind of like a train wreck. You know, you don't want to look at it, but you have to see it. Um, and it was, it was horrible. It, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not making light of it. It was horrible. But you can't blame. Why would you have a pet monkey in the first place? Yeah, Valerie would. But it, <laughs> at, wild animals, they're wild animals. We might think we can tame them and train them, but they can't be blamed. And there's no need for that uh, monkey, whatever it was, to um, apologize because they, it's what they are. However, and I'm saying all of that to make this point. Man stands unique in all of God's creation. Is the only creature that has the, the ability to go to God for forgiveness. For the things that we do, for the actions that we do. We have the ability to go to God for forgiveness. And not only is it an ability, it's a necessity. The reason I chose this passage to open up with, let's look at the first couple of verses again and just see what, what David writes here. It's called a Psalm of David. Many of your Bibles may have that title there. A psalm of David, a miskill, miskill, I think is how you pronounce it. It, really, it literally means giving of instruction. So David is writing based on experience here to instruct others. Of course, there are several psalms that he wrote on his, his going to God for forgiveness of his sins. This one here he writes, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Two things there he said about our sins. He says that blessed is the man or the one whose transgression is forgiven, and whose sin is covered. Two different words here. Two sets of different words, actually. Number one, transgression, which we understand to be sin. It means a, a breaking, breaking of a law, okay? Um, so transgression is forgiven. The forgive, forgiven means to be carried away or sent away, never to return. So keep that in mind as we talk about forgiveness because it's going to play an imp important role in this message, an important point in this message. So blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Well, sin is a different word than transgression, but they basically mean the same thing. It's, it, sin means to, to literally, I think the idea most preachers give it is to miss a mark, sort of like a marksman who is shooting at a target with a bow and arrow or a gun or whatever, I, you know, you shoot and you try and hit the target right in the center. And it means to miss, miss the mark is what it means. And um, that is an error. It's an imperfection. And in life, these marks need to be corrected or need to be forgiven. And the mark, of course, in our case, is Christ. That is who we are shooting for. We're trying to be like Christ. And the thing is, we can't do it, not without his help anyway. Then he goes on to say, blessed is the man in whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. There's another word for sin, transgression, sin, and now iniquity. They all basically mean the same thing as far as our accountability is concerned and our errors uh, are concerned. 
But and, and none of these apply to anybody other than man. This doesn't apply to God, doesn't apply to Satan, doesn't apply to angels, animals. It, it applies to you and me, man. So blessed is the man in this case unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. The word imputeth means to charge or hold accountable. So there's an implication here that because of the forgiveness and because of having our sins covered, we are not accountable for our sins. That's a wonderful thing. We're going to talk about that as we go through this as well. Then also in, whom, in whose spirit there is no guile. Listen to what he says in verse 3, because this is also going to play an important role as we go through this message and look at some different instances in the scriptures. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. This is very poetic. But we might want to think back, if you, if you do have a testimony of salvation, I think most everybody in this room has a testimony of salvation. Think back to prior to that moment of time when you put your faith in Christ as your Savior. What was going on in your, not just your mind, but in your soul? For me, it was a heaviness. We call it conviction. Something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong in my relationship with God. And it wasn't until I, I understood that where I really felt the, the guilt and shame. And for me, what it took was the word of God that painted this picture of God's expectations in my hearing, and I realized that I fell way short. As I was raised up, and even when I started going to the Little Missionary Baptist Church in Redondo Beach, I thought I was a pretty good guy. I didn't, I didn't realize I was lost. I have heard the phrase before, you know, being saved, being born again. I've heard of those things. I, I, not as a Catholic, actually, but I've heard the phrases that were out there. And I, my understanding was that because I was good religious, had done the things that I was required to do, that I was already that, saved born again. Never really gave it a second thought. I thought I was fine with God until I heard the word of God. Then I understood that something was wrong. And no matter how I tried to rationalize it, I knew that there was this imperfection about me that needed to be corrected. And I also knew that there was nothing I could do about it. And the more that I, I went on in this state, um, the more that this, this uneasiness built up in me. And this anger uh, within me built up um, until that moment when I put my faith in Christ and called out to him. And at that moment, and all of you can relate to this, all of my sins were washed away. We might not think about this, but it's the truth. That no matter what I've done prior to that point, I will never be held accountable for again. Now, like I said, I've never done really anything super horrendous. Okay, I've never murdered anybody. I, w I was never uh, arrested for anything. Um, I don't even think I, there's anything I've done that I could be arrested for, as far as I know. Um, so I wasn't really that bad of a person, but as far as God's concerned, his level of perfection, I fell way short. And the truth of the word of God is every single person does. This is really the beauty of the word of God, is that man, God wants to have this relationship with us, and if I had time, I'd go into the, the account in Genesis when Adam and Eve fell from grace. You can think about that because I'm sure you're familiar with it. But they had this perfect relationship with God. And as soon as they sinned, it was severed. Death entered the picture. Okay? They didn't drop dead immediately when they sinned. But when they sinned, that relationship with God was severed. And it needed to be repaired. That's why God killed the animal. He held the animal accountable. The lamb was held accountable for man's sins. I believe in the garden there that God, it by, in type, took their sins, put it on the animal, and held the animal accountable. In other words, I think they were saved right there in the garden. They were covered, their sins were gone, and then they were actually kicked out of the garden. But what I'm trying to get across here is, is how sin weighs on us. And, and I think sometimes it, we, we try to blame things for this, this guilt feeling that we have. We try to pass the buck to others for this, this feeling that we have, and it doesn't work. We are accountable for our sins, nothing or nobody else. 
is accountable. So I think I've answered this question in my, my notes here. Why is sin so important? Well, the, the simple statement is this, that without forgiveness of sins, our relationship with God is severed completely. Now, what about after we're saved? What about after we're saved? Can we, how can I put this? We're not going to die physically. We're never going to face hell. But do our sins separate us from God in our relationship? We know it does. We know it does. And, and that's the problem. As children of God, even saved, baptized, members of his church, when we get out of sorts, when we start to err in our thinking, um, harbor sin in our heart, in our mind, even do things that would be contrary to the word of God, we know that we have separated ourselves from God. And he's gracious enough to, to hold on to us, but there can come a point to where we can cross that line. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that as well. So let's talk about this. What did Jesus say about forgiveness of sins? And I'm not talking about the initial act of salvation. I'm going to address that at the end of this message. But what did Jesus say about sin to his disciples? Go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Part of what we call the model prayer. This passage or this portion I'm going to read for you proves that this cannot be the Lord's prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Some people call it the Lord's Prayer. But this is not a prayer that Jesus would pray. He prayed a lot. We considered that last week. But this is not a prayer that Jesus himself would pray. And this proves why. Verse 12. Forgive us our debts or sins as we forgive our debtors. Jesus never sinned. He never had to ask God for forgiveness of sins. He was never held accountable for his sins because he had no sins. However, the interesting thing is where Psalm 32 says that blessed is the man whose sins or transgressions are not imputed, not charged to him. Guess what? Somebody has to be accountable for those sins. They don't, they don't just go away to nowhere. There, there has to be somebody that is held accountable for our sins. It's not me. It, it should be me. But if I'm saved and if I go to the Lord for forgiveness, he is not holding me accountable for my sins. And that doesn't give me a free ticket to go out and do whatever I want. Okay? Whatever sins I want to do, knowing that all I have to do is ask God for forgiveness and he'll forgive. If I have that mentality, that is, that is sin leading into sin. It's not going to, it doesn't work. But somebody has to be accountable. Jesus never sinned. So this couldn't be, I left that you hanging there with that because I want to address that later as well. But he says in verse 12, forgive us our debts or sins as we forgive our debtors. Then he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's, let's just stop there. It doesn't end there, but we'll stop there for a moment. One thing that I think is important to think about, especially as church members, is that there is a higher purpose for our life than just this life right here. Brother Renee talked about that. And Susan mentioned it too when she was in, um, talking to some points, that a lot of people think that this life is what it's all about, that this is as good as it gets. And thankfully it's not. We have a higher purpose. And we're, we're going through this life with a higher purpose but this life is working contrary to that purpose. There, there is opposition in this world that is trying to pre prevent us from accomplishing our goal, and that is to be witnesses and testimonies of him on this earth, leading others to him. And the best way Satan can keep the lost lost, or those that don't know the Lord from coming to that knowledge, is by keeping us, those that do know him, from doing that. If we get distracted off course, practice sin, live in sin, all those people that we are involved with are not going to see a testimony of Christ. They're going to see somebody who claims to know Christ, but they really don't care. And what conviction is there in that? Point, though, is we have a higher purpose. So he says this. 
Verse 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, that means their trespasses against us. We don't, I can't forgive you of your sins that don't pertain to me. If you, if you, I don't want to single anybody up, but if somebody calls me a dirty dog, I don't know why I keep saying that. I heard an old preacher use that one time. It's kind of stuck in my head now, but I guess I can get a lot worse than that. But, you know, so he just doesn't like me and says, you know, this Steve Waters, he's just a dirty dog. Um, I can forgive you for that. If you come to me and say, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really think you're a dirty dog. I didn't mean to say that. That's, you know, just what it is. I, okay, I forgive you for that. I can forgive you of the sins you commit against me, but the sins that you commit that are connected to God and eternal things, I cannot forgive you for that. No man can forgive you of those sins, which is why it's foolish, as I learned, that you can't go to some other man and confess your sins because he has no power to forgive you of your sins and so on. But if you forgive men their trespasses, and men will trespass against us, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Wait, what? What does that mean? If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Well, exactly what you're thinking is exactly what it means, because he says that in the next verse. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. What does that mean? If we have an unforgiving heart, if we're not willing to forgive others, God is not going to forgive us of our sins. So what does that mean? Does that affect my relationship with God? Does that affect my prayer life? Does it affect my ability to witness to others? It does. Because if we're not being forgiven of our sins, that weight is continually building up. I've, I've seen people, and probably experienced this myself, where because of holding on to something, when I should be forgiving of it, for whatever reason, on any level, whether or not a person asked for forgiveness. But if I harbor anger towards somebody or something that they've done to me, it's going to affect me. However, if I release a person, and I, and I think you all know what I'm talking about, but if you don't, if somebody does harm me with their words or either by actions, and I refuse to forgive them, it doesn't affect them, especially if they don't even care to come to me for forgiveness. It doesn't affect them. It affects me. And even if they do come to me and apologize, and I say, okay, fine, whatever. And yet they apologize, they've done their part. Now they're free from whatever guilt and shame is there for that. Now I am the one that should be forgiving of them. I'm the one that's harboring this anger because I'm unforgiving. It's affecting me and my relationship with God and perhaps even others. The, the scenarios that I painted earlier about children born in situations... Some children come out of that fine, and they, they move on with their life. They, they have a happy, productive life, mainly because they don't want to be like the situation that they were involved in. I've known a lot of people like that. I've also known some who have been in situations where it was abusive to them, not the best scenario, but they harbor this anger. They, they can't let go of it. And mainly, you know, their parents don't care. They don't want forgiveness. They don't even think about it. It doesn't matter. A person has to be willing to just let it go and let God deal with it. Be willing to release them as far as you're concerned from that. And you might think, well, this doesn't seem fair. What they've done to me just isn't fair. Right, it's not fair. There, there's nothing in this life that's actually fair. My dad taught me that. In fact, there's one thing I remember him actually saying. He might have said it in sort of a jokey way as he often did. But one thing to understand about life is that life is not fair. It's not going to be fair. What is fair, though, is when God judges things. He will take care of it. So I've got to understand this in my relationship with God. I am not God. I am not set up as a judge in this world. That, that ability was not given to me. And I've been given the ability of limited forgiveness. Those things that affect me... I am obligated to forgive because I'm not to judge people. That's not my position. But if somebody comes to me and says, I'm sorry for what I did, fine. Let's, let's just move on, forget about it. And it should restore that relationship. You might ask, well, how often should I forgive my brother? 
Well, Peter asked that question. Let's go and see what the response is to that in Matthew chapter 18. When he says his brother, he's talking about uh, in church relationship. Because sometimes, and you know, some of you haven't been in church all that long. Um, but there, there can be times when church members hurt and devour one another. The Bible says that. And they're con- it's, it's condemned by the Lord, that type of behavior. But how often should we forgive somebody whom we're close to in a, in a relationship like this? Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. I'm not going to read the verses leading up to this, but Jesus simply says here, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. It does not say go and tell brother or sister so-and-so what brother or sister so-and-so did to you. (laughs) It says go and tell him or her the situation alone. If he shall hear thee, you have gained thy brother. And my experience has been, not just personally but in observation, a lot of times that's the best way to do it because sometimes we hear things differently than they're intended or say things differently than they're intended. And if, it, if somebody gets hurt by something that was said, first of all, I'll say this, don't be so easily offended <laughs> um, because that's an issue as well. But if, if it was taken away that has affected you and hurt you, talk to that person about it. And it might have just been something that came out the wrong way. Was it really meant that way? Um, Perhaps it was. They intended it to hurt you, though. And they wanted to cause harm to you. If that comes out, that needs to be resolved somehow, talked through, worked out. Misunderstandings happen between brothers and sisters in Christ. But it needs to be worked out. The next step, he goes on to say, it's, If that doesn't work, don't just let it go. I don't know if, I think this word is found, it's found in Isaiah, the word fester. I like that word, I don't know why, but (laughs) the word fester. If you get a cut in your, on your body and you just ignore it, it's going to go away, right? Sometimes it will, but it could get infected. And if it just festers there, it could get really bad and affect just, you know, the hand, the arm, and eventually the whole body. It will grow, Um, and that's what this type of thing can do in the body of Christ. It has to be corrected, okay? So this isn't necessarily personal sins between me and God. I think those pretty much are understood. We have to have that relationship on our part with God intact. This is talking about within the body of Christ. So he says in verse 16, If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more in the body of Christ, okay? That's obvious. To me, it's obvious. If, not, if it's not obvious for you, I'll simply say, say it. That is what he's talking about. Two or three more in the body of Christ, that with the mouth in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And that was an Old Testament law principle. They're held accountable to more than just the one that was offended. If you neglect to hear them, then tell it to the church. This completely negates any possibility of a universal church. Okay? This is talking about the local visible body of Christ, our understanding of what a church is. But if he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto thee a heathen and a man, um, heathen man and a publican. For I say unto you, whosoever shall whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's not a blanket. Um, statement saying we have all power. It's talking about within the context of what's being said here. We have the power to release somebody's sins if it is resolved, okay? But we also have the power as a church. If somebody refuses to hear and they're just going to be hard-headed, stubborn, stand their ground without just with just selfish ambitions, with no regard for the body of Christ, that is harmful to the church. Yes, it's hurtful to the the individual who was harmed. That individual needs to let it go for their sake. But the church, somehow, some way, needs to get involved because this type of thing will affect the body of Christ. 
And we, we can broaden this out to just sin in general. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, um, where if there's sin in the church, it needs to be dealt with. It can become as yeast, affecting the whole body, so it needs to be put away. It needs to be put out of the body. So the, the church actually has power to do that. It, because it affects us as a body individually. So he goes on to say, in verse 19, I say unto you that if two or three of you are get, uh, shall agree on earth, excuse me, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be down, done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Let me read that again a little bit more clearly. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they, they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in his heaven. Obviously referring to spiritual heavenly things. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. One of the most misunderstood verses in the entire scriptures in Christianity. It does not mean where two or three saved people gather together for Bible study that they constitute the body of Christ because they're assembled there reading the word of God. That might sound kind of extreme, but I actually had a, a fellow I worked with. We both got saved about the same time. He had no understanding of the local church. We were discussing the Bible one night. I think there was another person involved in our discussion. And he said, you know, we constitute a church right here. And I think I probably laughed because that's how I was back then. I go, no, no, it doesn't. We, this does not constitute a church. It constitutes a grocery store where people are talking about the Bible and nothing more. But it, it shows a great um, lack of understanding about what the church is. The church is a body of Christ that has a relationship with one another built in it and a relationship with God. And this forgiveness is absolutely necessary. Let's look at another example, I think, that is actually very fascinating and interesting. Back in Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. The last chapter of Genesis. Which you've either, if you're on the Bible reading plan for the year, have already read through or you are going to do it shortly. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. Now, I'm going to assume that most of you know or all of you know about the story about Joseph, how he was sold to slavery by his brothers. They treated him hatefully. They hated him because he was the father, his father's favorite. Uh, so they sold him into slavery. And then they just forgot all about him and they finally realize that uh, they come into Egypt um, and he's uh, one of the head honchos. He's top dog there. And his reaction when he meets his brothers, it was, it, it, I kind of imagine this in my mind, how after what they did to him and they finally realize, they get there and they realize this guy is their brother. It's like the, the look of shock on their face. I wish he would have had an iPhone back then. <laughs> to take a picture, snapshot that, because it must have just been like this look of, whoa, are we in trouble? Because you don't get much higher than Joseph at this time, and he's the one that's going to call the shots. Anyway, verse 14 says, When Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all that went up with them to bury his father, um, and he had buried, uh, after he had buried his father, and when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will, be, will peradventure, hate us, and will certainly requ um, requit us all the evil, require of us all the evil which we did to him. He's going to make us pay, is what they're thinking. Um, what's the word for that? Vengeance? Vengeance? They want to get vengeance? Or he's going to get vengeance on them? So that's what they assumed after dad's gone, now when the dust settles, that Joseph's going to get his. So they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he did die, saying... So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass thy brothers and, um, and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee forgiveness and trespass of the servants of God thy father. And Joseph wept when, he spoke, when they spoke unto him. Now let me, let me kind of put that in uh, maybe more modern terms how I see it. They said that dad said this. You need to forgive your brothers, okay? Uh, because God requires that forgiveness. Um, but th that was even necessary. And I think Joseph was already, he already had the heart of a forgiving servant. 
He did not hold them accountable for this. And I, I think that when he was in Egypt, and honestly, it had nothing to do with the position that he was in. It was his character. Even when he was in prison in, um, in Egypt, I think he had already let go of what his brothers did. And I, know, I, I believe this, because it's said here, that in his mind, he saw himself as somebody who was here for a bigger purpose. He understood a position. We know that he did, at least in part, because of the visions that he had, that he told his, his family, you know, um, the sun and the moon and the stars, his star outshines all of them, including his mom and um, his uh, brothers, and then the sheaves bowing down to his. He put, set himself up there, but he knew that he was in the process of God using him for great things. And sometimes that means bad things happening to God's people. It's, it's, it's a constant throughout the scriptures. He did not let it get to him. So the point of all of this for us is that we can sometimes get ourselves into a mess because of our own dumb decisions, um, and God will forgive us for that. But there are times when bad things happen in our lives, either to us personally or to test and challenge us from God's part. Job is an example of that. But God is going to try to test us and prove us because he has a bigger plan for us. And I think even on a, on a global scale, all of, all of mankind born into this world, like I said, um, Helen Keller, I, I'd like to think just out of sympathy for what all that she went through, that she was saved. But you know what? Just because she was born blind, deaf, and dumb, not able to speak, she was very intelligent, by the way. Our, our language kind of messes that word up. But she couldn't speak. I, I can't imagine anything worse. And you would think that God would give her a, a pass, right? Not being accountable for her sin. But it doesn't work that way. She just, she was born in a bad situation. I hope she was saved. I hope she came to an understanding of the truth. I have no idea though. But I know the, the requirement of salvation is the same for everybody. Keep that in your mind, okay? I'm going to close out with a, a passage that I think relates to that. Back to this, though, verse 18, it says, His bro brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. So they were going to humble themselves. <laughs> Boy, you talk about a prophecy coming true or a, a dream coming true. They fell before his face and said, We're your servants. Those sheaves bowing down. Anyway, Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God. What a great attitude. But as for you, you thought evil against me. He knew that. But God meant it unto good. To bring to pass, as at this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. What a great attitude. You talk about, he could have done anything he wanted to them out of vengeance. But he refrained, he restrained himself because he knew God did not put him in that position. He saw the bigger picture. There's a couple of other um, verses that I have. In fact, I think I will mention them, so bear with me for a moment before we get to the closing. But let's just consider um, an obvious one in Matthew chapter... Did I not write the verse down? Uh, I'm sorry, it's Luke. Luke chapter 23. This is, this is an obvious one, uh, but it's so powerful. Because there is there's no greater act of intentional and willful harm to somebody than what was done to Jesus Christ out of sheer hatred. So Luke chapter 23, I know you all know the story, of course, how he was arrested, the way he was treated, beaten, spit upon, the very least, he was utterly embarrassed, shamefully embarrassed in front of everybody. But verse 34 says this. One of his last statements on the cross, while well, he's on the cross, 
Verse 34 says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Isn't that amazing? That doesn't just include those guys that were spitting on him, tormenting him. It included us. The forgiveness of sins that was accomplished on this cross goes far beyond our imagination. Everything about God's covering for our sins and his charging somebody else with our sins, my sins, other than me, is right here. It was Jesus. He was held accountable for my sins to correct that problem that we have of the separation between us and God. It was rectified right here on the cross. And we know that God accepted the sacrifice. You know how? Because three days later, just as he said, he came out of the grave. Out of the grave. And our sins are gone because of that. But we still need forgiveness of sins because we're not yet in that glorified state. So we're going to sin while we're in this flesh. This covered all of that. But the necessity of forgiveness of sin is still ever-present. Well, you might say, well, that's the Lord. How can a man do that same thing, have that same attitude of forgiveness in such a situation? Well, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And starting in verse 54... We're, we were first introduced to Stephen just by name back in chapter 6 as one of the seven deacons. I believe this is the same person. But then he's called upon to preach the message of his life in front of a Sanhedrin council. Men who had ultimate charge were able to do anything they wanted based on the law, but they didn't have to get permission. The permission was within them. And of course, Saul was there um, as part of this, and he was one that was going to give this mob the permission. But he preached a message that was so powerful and so convicting that it angered them, not to the point of repentance, though, to the point of hatred. They wanted to kill him. Peter preached a message that angered people, but it prompted many of them to ask, what must we do to be saved? Paul preached a message like that. But in this situation here, in verse 51, as Stephen closes out his message, and I've never done this in closing out a message, but he says here, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed us uh, before the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law, by the dispensation of angels and have kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. That, that term is used of conviction, but it didn't prompt them to repentance. It says they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were angry. And he, Stephen, now, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. This is one of the most amazing verses in the scriptures to me. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down the clothes at the feet of a young man's, uh, feet of a, a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. English language is kind of funny, depending on how you read this. But they didn't stone Stephen while they were calling upon God. They weren't even thinking about God. They were full of just emotion and anger at this time. I don't think God was even part of their minds. But it's Stephen who's calling upon God. And this is what Stephen says. In complete contrast to their anger, he says... Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he said this, I love this too. He fell asleep. He fell asleep. Meaning he died. They killed him. But he knew the bigger picture. I don't know if he was prepped for this, the outcome of this. I doubt if he was. I don't even think he had time to prepare a message 
I think it was just on the spot that he was filled with the Holy Ghost and he preached the message of his life. And of course, because of that, Saul was converted. But he saw the bigger picture. But the important thing there is that he, he died in complete peace, not even with any anger towards those that were treating him that way. He asked God to forgive them. And I wonder, well, I, I know the answer to this. <laughs> I was going to say, this is how dumb initial thoughts can be. But I wonder if any of them were actually saved because of this. <laughs> we know there was. Saul saw this and he was affected by what had happened. Last passage, Mark chapter 2. I, I've, I have and I can preach a whole message from this little passage of Scripture. It's found in three of the four Gospels. But I want to use it as a closing point. Mark chapter 2. One, this, this is one of my favorite passages to preach on. I could go another hour if you would, if you would let me. <laughs> and, you, and you would let me, wouldn't you? <laughs> Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Again, Jesus came to Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Straightway many were gathered together, insomuch as there was no room to receive him, uh, receive them, no, not as much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. This is where I would comment on all of this, but I'm not going to do that because this is this. I'm not going to preach this. Just close with it. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So back to our earlier points, this man was born in a pretty bad situation. He had no use of his arms or his legs. He was what we understand to be a quadriplegic. At least he couldn't walk. I believe he was a quadriplegic. But nonetheless, he was carried by four. When they could not come near unto him, Jesus, they could not come near to Jesus because of the press, they uncovered the roof where he was when they had broken it up and they let down uh, the bed whereupon the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, listen to this, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. I love this. This is so amazing. What just happened here? On the, on the surface, it would seem like his friends are taking this man who can't walk to Jesus because everybody knows already at this time, Jesus has the power to heal. But I don't think this man even cared at this time about the fact that he couldn't walk. He wanted his friends to get him to Jesus for this reason. Because Jesus addresses nothing else at this time. It says he knew their hearts. He saw their faith and he knew their hearts. He saw their faith. He saw, th and the men who took him had faith as well. So this would go back in, in kind of our scenario here of intercessory prayer. When we're praying for somebody, we are, are praying for them, taking them to the Lord. And we have to actually sometimes get involved and bring them to the Lord, be, to church, to hear the word of God. But we have to get involved sometimes to actively get involved in talking about the Lord to them. But Jesus saw their faith. And he said, son, your sins are forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. They said, why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, let's be fair. This was a good question. Okay. This was a good question because in their hearts, they're right. Because only God can forgive sins in this way. But what they didn't understand was that Jesus is God. So, in verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned within themselves, he said, why do you reason these things in your hearts? And I love this also. What's easier to say to the sick of the palsy? Thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up your bed and walk. But that you should know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed and go thy way to thine house. So, just very quickly, because I hate to do the whole message on this, but what is easier to say? Take up your bed and walk, or your sins are forgiven you? Well, let me just put it this way. Easton was talking about God speaking things into existence. All he had to do was say the word, and this man would be healed. And he did. <laughs> That's what he did. But God cannot just speak and have our sins forgiven. He can't. 
And I can prove that to you. He can say it here, but it is contingent on the fact that he knows that there is an appointed time when he's going to bear the sins of the world and take them to the cross. He knows that. So he says this in how people were saved at this time on the contingency that their sins are going to go to the cross. Do you realize that when people were saved in the Old Testament, it was saved with that fact in mind? They were saved, certainly, fully, to the fullest, but it didn't become reality as far as man is concerned until Jesus died on the cross. That's what became reality. And for us today, we look back, we call upon the Lord, and immediately when we go to him for salvation, our sins are forgiven because he already bore our sins. And he says to us, when we call upon him, your sins are forgiven. I think, and I, I, I don't know any other way to look at this, but I think we have a testimony of salvation right here in this account. I know there's a lot of times when these Old Testament people were already saved, but I think in this case here, this man, we don't know why, we don't even know how old he was, but I would imagine that he had some sort of bitterness in him because of his condition, and I would understand that, okay? But he knew that Jesus had the power to not just heal him. In fact, that wasn't even a, a thought. He knew he was a sinner, and he went to the Lord, the only one that has the power to forgive sins. This is such a huge subject in the scriptures. I, I've only, in these, I don't know how long it's been, almost an hour now. I don't know. There's a lot more to this than I brought out in this message here of forgiveness of sins. But the main points I wanted to get across in the importance of this forgiveness is number one, it's important to forgive others. Number two, it's important to forgive ourselves. Forgive ourselves. We're going to fail. We're going to fail God. Sometimes on a daily basis. I've failed God so many times. And I've gone to him for forgiveness. And then I've failed again with the same sin. I'm so thankful that God, as he told Peter, that, well, I didn't get to that part, but 70 times 7, we forgive our brothers. 70 times 7, God is forgiving God. We need forgiveness of sins. So, to conclude the message from last week, this is a necessary part of of our prayers, okay, for the forgiveness of sins, forgiving others, forgiving ourselves, going to the Lord for this forgiveness because he is the only one that can take our transgressions and take them away. There's a, a passage that, um, I think it's in one of the Psalms actually, just, just came to my mind, but it talks about our sins when they're forgiven being as far gone as the east is from the west. They will, we will never see them again, they are completely gone. We are the ones that bring them back sometimes, not only for ourselves, but with others. How many times have you thought about how somebody has wronged you, even after you've forgiven them, or whatever the case may be? We're going to stand at this time and have a song of invitation. I don't know your hearts. I'm not like Jesus. I can't look at you and know what you're thinking. But the Lord could. He knows right now what's on your heart. If there is some area that you need forgiveness, Maybe salvation, I don't know. Somebody watching on YouTube, I don't know what your need is. Maybe you are saved, and you're trying to get through life struggling with something that should be gone a long time ago. Just let it go. We have this opportunity to take these things to the Lord. We're going to sing a, a couple of verses of a song. Uh, 330. 330. There's a need. Won't you take that burden to the Lord? First and last.
thank you for your attention this morning. I hope that each one received a blessing from the services today. Um, we have a couple on the phone here. Is Sister Dolores on the phone? No, not this morning. It must be Sister Jesse and Brother Ralph. So glad you're able to join us in this way. Um, any word before we dismiss? Yes, Brother Robert. Uh, for my sister, Ray Reyna, <clears throat> she's in the hospital, uh, Ill, Ill this time with obstruction. Uh, in her stomach, she's not able to pass food. And uh, they have her on a liquid diet right now. And, um, she's, she's pretty sick with this. She had a, a surgery before 10 years ago for the same type of uh, problem. So she's really concerned about her health right now because she's 10 years old and, and it's, uh, it's really taking its toll on her right now. Yeah. So we just, I'm just praying for the short health for her. Yeah. Yeah, she's in a very uncomfortable situation, a lot of pain. So let's just pray the doctors are able to uh, help her by God's grace. Yes. And my sister Kai, Sister uh, Christ here at GCMD, just to pray for her for her salvation, uh, for just to keep her, because I don't want her to fade off. And she started to be more wrapped up in her her health situation and her her faith. And I just you know, I know she's dealing with a lot. She has a a, a problem with her digestive system as well. She's she's not able. She's constipated uh, quite a bit, but it's still a little serious problem as well. So again, I pray for restored health for her. But number one, I pray that she just keeps keeps on uh, keep her faith going and, and uh, just Amen. I don't want to fade off as she's starting to. Amen. All right, let's keep these requests in prayer. Others that were mentioned as well, let's keep each other in prayer. Anything else at this time? If not, we're going to dismiss, and uh, 2 o'clock is when we're meeting back, right? Is that the time we decided? 2 o'clock? Okay. So we meet back at 2 o'clock uh, for afternoon service. If there's nothing else, I'm going to ask uh, Sister Valerie, would you please dismiss us in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the many blessings that you give us daily, Lord, and we just thank you that we're able to come to your throne, Lord, with all these prayer requests, and we know that you hear each and every one of them, Lord, and we just ask that you please um, answer them according to your will, Father. Um, thank you for the message that was brought, Lord, and for your abundant mercy and your grace uh, upon us, Lord, and, and forgiving uh, our sins, Lord, and just um, help us so we could stay close to you, Lord, and uh, to witness to others and to be a good testimony, Father, and just please help especially those who are lost, Lord, um, our friends and our family and our loved ones, Lord, before it's too late. Father, please uh, best bless us as we go to lunch, Lord, and we meet back here later, Lord, just watch over all of us, those who are not able to be here, Father. We ask that you come back soon, Father, and all these things I ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.